Welcome to our interview series, We Choose to Thrive, brought to you by Becky Norwood of The Woman I Love. We bring you stories of survivors who have chosen to heal, to thrive. If you are an abuse survivor and are starting or continuing your healing journey, these stories will provide hope, inspiration, and a knowingness that you are not alone. Join us in today's interview. Since I've been talking about it, it's amazing how many people there are that have been through this. And so that's one thing I've learned a lot, that it's everywhere. Tell us a little bit about you and kind of a brief history of what happened to you, and then we'll go from there. Okay. I was born and raised in the South, was born in Columbus, Georgia, and have lived in um, Smith Station, Alabama pretty much all my life. I just graduated with my bachelor's at Auburn University last year in uh, political science, uh, international relations focusing in, the nor in North Africa and the Middle East. At first, I wanted to go get my master's in Egypt at the American University in Cairo, but I went with a child and a husband. I decided to stay at home and just get my master's at Auburn, and that's what I just started with that last year. I am finishing up my last year now to get my master's in public administration, focusing in nonprofit and women's health and uh, sexual violence prevention. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been wonderful. I got my internship um, at the Sexual Assault Support Center in Columbus, Georgia, and it has been phenomenal. I've learned a lot. I've been really hands-on, especially with grant writing. I just wrote a grant uh, last two, no, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, about two weeks ago. It was for my position. They wanted to hire me as the media and outreach coordinator. So that it'll be for my position. So fingers crossed that I get in. Oh, yes, for yeah. sure. It's, wow. It was That's really amazing. exciting. We had been talking about um, me coming on full time, but it had been just kind of quiet talking and like not, not really, uh, I guess, too serious. And then I had the serious talk. She said, well, I would like for you to stay on. Um, this is what my proposal is, this, this grant. I would like you to write it and I will help you with it and we will submit it and Hopefully, you know, I'll find out hopefully next month near October and if I if we got the grant and if I will have a job after graduation. <laughs> oh, you must be so proud of yourself. I, I, it, it took me a long time to actually say that because part of the counseling that I went through was saying how proud I am of myself and um, <laughs> having so many issues with that. I, I used to be really bad about complimenting myself or if someone complimented me I would always put it down mm -hmm. and so now to say that that I'm proud of myself that I've worked so hard for this it is it's a phenomenal feeling it's like I'm you don't realize how unhappy you were until you're happy again isn't that amazing it, it really is and I did not realize how upset and miserable I guess and how much I, I dislike myself until I got counseling, um, they started me on medication for the anxiety and everything, and I, it's it's a phenomenal feeling how much has been accomplished and how much um, I've done in the short period of time, because I just came out talking about what happened to me last year. So what did happen to you? I was always a relatively quiet child, and I never got into trouble at all. I was in band. I had very good grades. I never, I, I was too terrified to do anything that my mother did not want me to do. So I had, I had friends that um, did do, like, bad things, but they weren't bad kids. They just made mistakes. And, but uh, one night, I had spent the night with a, a friend, and her, while her mother was out of town, and she invited her boyfriend and his friend over. And I guess I, can't, I, I was going to change their names to, you know, protect their privacy because I'm actually, I'm still friends with them. Jane and John, like Jane was my best friend. John was her boyfriend. I actually didn't protect my um, assailant's name, but his name was Chad. He, he was very misogynistic money over bitches or something like that. He was yeah, he wasn't a very, very nice guy. He always made me uncomfortable. It's like I kinda had a sixth sense of 
that he wasn't a very nice guy, but, you know, my friend was like, oh, he's very nice. He's just, he just acts like this, like, yeah, you know. So, and I knew he had some sort of attraction or affection for me, but it was never reciprocated, and I think that made him mad um, a lot. The night that I spent over, spent the night over at her house, and um, they came over, well, I, I begged my friend, please don't leave me alone with him, because I knew, like, like I said, how he made me feel. I didn't like him. Her and her boyfriend went to sleep. He uh, came. He, we were sitting on a couch in the living room, and he came over and sat in it just closer to me and was just touching me, and it made me really uncomfortable. So I, I got up and walked over to the love seat on the other side of the room. I had stretched my legs out so, like, as an indicator, I don't, you know, want you next to me. And he lifted up my legs and sat up like underneath them and put my legs across his and he kept um you know touching me on my arm um and then I had a silver belt on and he uh touched and he said oh I like silver things and began to undo my belt and it like I remember feeling nauseated and very uncomfortable and I remember I had a I put a pillow over my face I think it was like a way just to kind of disappear of how uncomfortable I felt so I got up and I went to the master bedroom, her uh, mother's room, just to, to go away and to leave me, you know, just to like, you know, stop. And I got up and he followed me in there. He had shut the door behind him and I had crawled into the bed and pulled the covers over me. I was in the fetal position on my left side, uh, facing the wall with a window beside me. And he lifted up the covers and crawled on top of me. And I could feel everything um, on me. He kept trying to pull my face towards him and kept trying to, like, kiss the side of my face. And then he kept trying to yank my face. And that's one thing now that I can't stand. I don't like where people to touch my face or to, like, kind of move it or anything that bothers me. I actually blacked out after a certain point, And I'm not positive of what happened. Began, he touched um, my, my vagina, my area down there, and, like, fondled my breasts. And um, I could feel where he was getting aroused on my leg, and I kept telling him no and to stop. And actually, at one point, I began to cry. At that point in my life, uh, my biological father is an alcoholic, and I did not really trust many men except for my brother. He was the only man in my life at the time that I, I guess I really loved and trusted. And so I called, you know, I was crying for him. I was crying for uh, saying, Sean, you know, uh, please help me. And I'm actually not very religious either, but I was, I, I didn't care who heard me. I called out to God, to anybody who could help me. And I remember looking out the window and just wishing I was anywhere but where I was at. After that, I don't remember what happened. So what, where are you, you know, with all this trauma, where are you right now in your healing process? I would say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant process forever, but I'm at a good place now. I um, have realized, I guess, what I want to do and my purpose and I, you know, at the time, I think I wanted to be an archaeologist, and I still have that love of history. But I, I realized, you know, I wanted to 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 fight this, to fight this this epidemic. That yes, and that's one thing where I, where I've worked at the sexual assault support center. That's one thing my um, executive director, when she has done speeches, is that she always points out that. An epidemic is defined as being wide-ranging, and it encompasses a lot of people, and that's exactly what this is. And I don't think people realize, you know, that they think of epidemic, they think of, you know, like a virus outbreak or something. But in, and in that, it affects a lot of people too, but people don't see this as affecting a lot of people when it really does. And since I've came out to talking about it, I've had messages um, through Facebook of people that I've known for years that just, they disclosed to me what happened, and they have never told anybody. I think that there's a lot of people that have gone to their grave never saying what happened. It's, it's incredibly heartbreaking. And, I mean, my mother was a, uh, is a survivor of domestic violence, and her first husband that actually ended up in a miscarriage where he had beat her. I guess I really... 
I don't know, had a, a feeling that just this is where I needed to be and where I belong and where I, my, my talents are really needed in this area to work, to, to spread awareness, to, to bring more groups together. And that's what part of the job I'm doing now with being media and outreach is to, um, I'm trying to work with closely with the um, disability um, communities and the um, LGBT communities to bring more awareness with them as well because this is a, a, a huge problem in their cultures. I, I'm, I think a lot of people tend to forget that sexual assault affects everybody mm -hmm. and so cultures and groups. It, 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 it's it a huge problem, but nobody talks about it. So, so that's one thing I've learned is um, where I work, there has been a huge incline with disabilities and uh, mental um, illnesses, especially. We've had seen more clients come in that have had mental illness that were abused. You, and it's, you know, usually typically by someone that they know and a loved one. Yes, that's, that's the saddest part is for many of us that we've experienced either depressions or, you know, the statistics are that many, many of us that have gone through this, we do a lot of self-abusive things and Definitely. because we, we are so, it's like a self-loathing that happens. At one point, I was scratching my wrists. I had, um, I had this feeling that I had done something wrong. I had blamed myself, and I um, met my well, at the time, he was my boyfriend. Now he's my husband. We've been together for 12 years. I met him a few months after it happened, and he was, I, he, the, the, the guy who had done that to me was actually in his car and saw the picture of me and um, said all these awful things about me, and my husband promptly told him to get out of the car, and, um, and then he asked me, he's like, you don't have to tell me, you know, exactly what happened, he said, but you know, if I'm, he was basically saying that he was here to listen if I ever needed anything. And so I told him what happened. He was, I guess, the first person I talked to besides my friend that night I told, or that morning I told her about what had happened. And she did not believe he would have done something like that to me. And I, you know, we were 15 at the time. And I look back and I don't, I don't blame her because it wasn't her fault what he did. Right. And, um, we're still friends to this day. But with my husband, when I disclosed to him, he was the first person to really, I guess, believe me. He just hugged me, and he was so upset that that had happened to me. And I guess I was very fortunate to have that first good experience, but I went through so many years of self-loathing. Um, I felt like I wasn't good enough for him. Um, at one point, I was, you know, thinking, like, do I you know, split up with him so he can find someone who's not as screwed up as me. <laughs> it was self-sabotage. So what did you do to start healing? Uh, my grandmother got very sick, and I um, had helped take care of her, so it, it hit me hard when she passed away. And a few months after she had passed away, I realized I needed counseling because I wasn't moving past it. And so when I went to grief counseling, she um, we took a day to talk about like the past and other personal issues and she said she dug it out of me and she said I she said after we're done with this I want you to start seeing a personal counselor she said I think that will help you a lot and um, she gave me some information and they, they were wonderful um, Gentiva Hospice with their counseling I think really helped start the ball rolling and when I, a year I, it took me a year to get into the personal counseling because I being stubborn I didn't think I needed it Auburn University has counseling for their students I started there my counselor she was absolutely wonderful I have to say she I, I remember my our first session I had to write down five things that I loved about myself and I thought oh this is easy five things okay we can do this <laughs> like intelligence, caring nature, and then I stopped. And I and that's I said I only can write down two things. Like that's not a good sign. And that's when I realized I'm like, okay, I've got I've got to work on this. I, I can't just love two things about me. And also for my daughter, I wanted I, I I after I had her I worried if something like this happened, I don't want her to see that this this is the only way to deal with it, like how I was dealing with it, and just it's not what our children do to us. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. she 
she was, I guess, the really first push, but like grief counseling really kind of really opened my eyes that there was a bigger problem. And um, like I said, after counseling at Auburn, I felt pretty amazing coming out of it that I finally began to love myself. I had, I had body issues because I am a plus size woman. I thought, I guess, unworthy or I just, I had to cover myself up because I would like not only to hide my shame, but to hide the way I looked. So like now I actually, I feel better. I, I feel like I dress like, ha like I feel happier. Like whereas before it was black, big, or just like, just, I didn't, it, nothing, I don't know. I didn't worry about that. Now it's, it's, it's just, a ha I'm happier. And I think that ref that's a reflection. Flex everywhere and how you dress, how you walk, how you speak, you know, yes. these things are so important. Yes. What would you recommend to, to somebody that's just starting down this healing path and just realizing that they are not all alone and that they should get help? What would you recommend to them? That there is support, um, it, even like, for example, where I work, we've had clients that have no support whatsoever with family, but there are people that are there that care and that help, and there are services usually in your area that are free or at little to cost, at little cost, and I, I really enjoy the um, autonomy of it and the, and the where, where you can, you can do this on your own, but you're not on your own. I don't, I think support is so huge, and if, and don't be scared to talk about it, because there's nothing to be ashamed, uh, because it was done to you, and that's one thing that I've learned, even using the term victim, I used to avoid it uh, completely, but victim means that something was done to you, and there's nothing to be ashamed of about this, uh, it's, it's such a heavy feeling. And even now, I mean, even now in the happiest moments that I have now, I still feel that, like, that that, that shame might be crawling back up. Last um, April, um, I did a campaign where I posted every day on social media about what happened to me, the, the details and everything, and the aftermath. And it was really hard to talk about, especially knowing that I had family members that would see it and would know what he did to me, what I felt, what I could feel from him, where he was touching me. And, I mean, my brother was, I hated that he saw it too because I know it made him really, really upset. But it was a positive experience for me to get it completely out there. And afterward, I'm like, during the whole thing, I received messages from people that I did know, didn't know, people who had just saw it and were, and were just, you know, while they said they couldn't, outwardly um, respond or like it that they wanted to they wanted me to know that they that um, I had their support and that it it really was freeing for them it's very strengthening but it also I think would give other people that maybe have never spoken courage to speak up have you ever kind of journaled or written about your your experience I have written a few times for, uh, um, I wrote a paper for a class at Auburn about it, and uh, it was right before my graduation for my bachelor's. It was, I kind of feel like it was like a closing of a chapter in my life, and I'm opening up this new one for the master's degree and for my work experience and everything, and just, just life in general, and um, I ended up, the stress from school ended up, uh, I ended up having a panic attacks, and well, one night I was walking to my car, and I saw a man, because I generally, I have pretty much general anxiety when it comes to men, and if I don't know them, I usually avoid them, or have that flight, fight, or freeze response, and I saw him, and when I was walking to my car, and I just lost it, and I remember I couldn't breathe, I felt like, like I was burning up, and my chest was killing me, and and I went to the doctor because um, I was crying nearly every day just from anxiety from everything. And that, like, really pushed it over the edge, like the already uh, anxiety that I had from this. So I went to the doctor, and that's when they pushed Grammy off to um, help it. And that has been phenomenal um, in helping me uh, deal with anxiety. Now, I still have my, what I used to call good days and bad days, but um, the bad days are not as frequent, and um, uh, it's, I try not to call them bad days anymore, because it's, 
There's, there's triggers. There's triggers that yeah. happen in our lives, uh, just everyday living. Yes. And we have to be watchful of our triggers. If exactly. We start realizing that there's certain things that will trigger. Maybe it's a stressful situation. Maybe it's being too tired. Maybe it's in the, at the process. Maybe you're you're catching a cold or being you're you're not you're not on your top of your game. Yeah. And, and life situations that are going to happen regardless. Sometimes there are real triggers, and that's where we have to stay on top of it to watch right. those triggers and then take the steps we need to take to to avoid falling into that slump again. Excellent. I, I worry about the people that do not, you know, are not as familiar with this sort of thing and they don't know how to deal with it. And like you said, with the support, if they don't have that support to talk to. Thankfully, I have my husband to talk to and my coworkers and that's um, and my friends at school and everything. But some people do still, you know, feel alone and they don't have that. And that's what really worries me and, you know, breaks my heart is that they're not alone and, and, there, and what I love, there are anonymous sites where you can post, and I've done that in, that in the beginning, and that was very freeing as well. Um, Rain now has that online um, where you can talk to someone like in a chat, and I really I enjoy that. I've used that a couple of times. Send me some, some of those links to the you know places yeah. that are anonymous because I've started a Facebook group I would love for you to be a part of. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to be posting the resources. That's where I started, you know, for the other interviews that I've started doing. I'm posting them there and on my website. But the, the biggest thing for this whole, this whole process is to create the awareness and to give hope to other people that have gone through this that they're not alone. Yes. That, that, you know, here we are. There's a whole bunch of us. Let's heal. Let's not just survive. Let's heal and thrive in our lives. You know, That's wonderful. I applaud you for the courage that you have. I applaud you. Thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. You're welcome. Having the love in your heart and the caring that you want to reach out and doing all that you're doing in your life to create that awareness. This story was brought to you by The Woman I Love at www.thewomanilove.com. If you are starting down the path to healing, no matter what stage, our united message is that you are not alone. We do not want to live with a victim mentality. We choose to thrive, and as such, we are joining hands to spread the message that you too can heal and thrive. Will you join us as a force of change we need in our world? Only by healing, growing strong, and uniting can we create the awareness of this terrible epidemic that is plaguing our world. We heal in many different ways. There is no one right way to heal. But the right thing to do is to heal. Heal for yourself, for your families, and for our world. Will you join us in this We Choose to Thrive revolution? Reach out to us at www.thewomanilove.com. Also, check out the incredible resources at www.rainn.org. And if you are actively facing abuse in this moment, do not delay. Seek out help in your local community immediately. Here is to your wellness, healing, and thriving.